Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your <coughs> host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and joining us now, as he does on the first Monday of every month at the 10 o'clock hour, is Dr. Michael Lake, the senior pastor of Biblical Life Assembly. He's also the chancellor and founder of Biblical Life College and Seminary, and serves as an educational consultant for various Christian organizations around the world. He's also the author of the best-selling books, The Shinar Directive, Preparing the Way for the Son of Perdition, and The Shiriath Imperative, Empowering the Remnant to Overcome the Gates of Hell. Dr. Lake is known for his where the rubber meets the road preaching style. His goal is to help believers to be strengthened and to honor God by living his word in every situation in life. You can follow his teachings at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Here to host this Kingdom Intelligence Hour is our good friend, Dr. Michael Lake. Michael, good to see you. Good to see you this month, brother. It is uh, always a joy. The feedback we get is that uh, it's like watching two friends sitting together having a cup of coffee and getting to uh, just kind of watch uh, the dynamic that uh, <clears throat> we tend to cover issues in a way that they don't hear that narrative and other teachings and really you know most people don't get to hear conversations like we have uh, they don't have them with each other because either foundationally they just don't have that common thread or they don't really have the background so they get to sit in and kind of vicar vicariously live this life through us of uh, going wider, deeper, longer into uh, many areas of the, of the text. That's right. And, uh, you know, we're, we're living in a generation that live by sound bites. Sound bites, you can't get a very deep conversation in. I remember when I was having uh, open uh, men's uh, Bible studies, and we'd have men from other churches, many times other pastors come in, and I would uh, challenge them to go beyond their soundbite to define what they were saying in that soundbite, and they couldn't do it. And it, it really shows you how that in the midst of being able to have access almost to everything ever printed in English about the Word of God, we, we tend to be the, some of the most illiterate people in history regarding it, the Word. You know, you, you bring up a very interesting point. Um, <clears throat> You and I have a very dear friend in common, uh, Mike Heiser, and uh, both of us greatly respect his work. And uh, he came out with a study guide on the Book of Enoch, and so extra biblical text, but nevertheless referred to in the New Testament uh, by Jude, by Peter, and so we know that there was in first century Judaism uh, that the Book of Enoch played an important role in understanding a much greater depth of Genesis 6 and the consequences of this fallen angel society. What was interesting in that discussion was that um, while he was talking, I was doing a little background research and it never had occurred to me before that Enoch was the embodiment of what God's desire was for us in the garden and that was for him to have regular fellowship and so that one passage in Enoch walked with God and was no more the backstory of it is he walked with God for 365 years this is God's desire for all of us and so in this one passage the backstory of that passage is a 365-year period where he walked with God. <clears throat> 365, of course, is the number of days in our Julian or Gregorian calendar year. So it means he walked with God every day for the duration of his life, and then he was no more, which is this picture of what happens to us. So our, we live this life where we should be walking with the Lord every day, and God shows us that he continues to pursue that relationship with us because without that relationship, there's no understanding of the consequences of our actions, the consequences of our words, uh, the uh, 
pursuit of truth becomes now a moving target because what is truth? You and I agree truth is scripture. There's one, yes. there's just one truth, and that truth is scripture. So if we're going to be people who pursue truth uh, in this generation, in this time, we have to have that foundational text in order to keep us in check. And this illiteracy, biblical illiteracy problem, and these soundbite messages of taking something so totally out of context. Uh, how I long to hear Jeremiah 29 11 preached in context because it is so apropos for today. We are a people who are in exile. We're not in the promised land. We've become these idol worshipers. We're suffering the same consequence that Israel did. And yet, right in the midst of this punishment, uh, I hear the words of my father when he was about to take a hairbrush to my backside and tell me that he's doing this for my benefit and it's going to be harder on him than it is on me, but he's doing it because he loves me. Uh, this is God's message, is that there's consequences to our action, but it's for our refinement if we would just learn from them. But we're not guiding people in that understanding. We're not. Uh, somehow the millennial generation has this um, attitude, I think it goes beyond the millennials, that they, they believe the universe should succumb to their will, what they want, whether it's based on reality or not. And, you know, for every action, there's an equal or greater reaction. We have, we have in a sense, lost that. Or, uh, the Bible says in another way that you're, whatever you reap, you're going to sow. Now, you can even be forgiven of what you have sown, but many times in the, in the natural, you have set things into motion that, that will carry out. And what we learn uh, from many of the stories in the Word of God, it not only affects you, but it can affect future generations. And we, we, we have lost that concept, and because of that, um, we're, we're, we're in a place where we really can't learn. How, how can I learn when I don't think that my actions have any consequences whatsoever? You can't. You can't parent that way. You can't live a life that way. Um, you know, we were introduced a long time ago to trickle-down economics. You know, it, it, uh, corporate... High level corporate, all of a sudden that rolls down to the individual from uh, GDP to individual wealth or individual jobs, pay, things like that. The decisions made at one level have an impact. It's that ripple in the water when you throw that rock in there and it has concentric circles. And those concentric circles don't really, uh, they have more more impact closer to the epicenter, but it does not stop until its energy is completely dispersed. And that's usually a pretty far-reaching circle. And our lives are concentric. Uh, if we do it God's way, God is the center, and our life revolves around that. In this new Copernican kind of world that we're in, uh, <clears throat> the thought is, is that the world re revolves around self, uh, and, and Copernicus was rejected in his time. He died as a um, shamed scientist only to be proven to be uh, the, the, the great, one of the greatest visionaries of his time, uh, but rejected because of old school thinking and not wanting to believe that we, the earth, was not the center of the universe. And so we've adopted that behavior today, and it affects our children, our grandchildren, and it's unfortunate because there's a, a, a drift, and we're drifting without any course correction that is causing us to go so far away that we've eliminated the Holy Spirit from our churches. We've relegated 
the, fa the father to a supporting role, and it's a Jesus-only culture, and even that's packaged in a feel-good message that feel-good messages don't have consequences. No, they don't. You know, in the Garden of Eden, you know, God didn't come down and say, so Adam and Eve, how do you feel? <laughs> it, it, that, that wasn't it. There, there were consequences for what they did. And because of this, I, I think with the attitude that we're taking, this, this coming up generation is ill-prepared for spiritual warfare. Because when, when you really understand the dynamic of the commandments of God, everything is binary. You know, when, when in, in, in computer, you know, it's ones and zeros. Either you're opening, you're opening something or you're closing something. The way that we think, what we say, and what we do either opens a door or it closes a door. And uh, because we, we have lost that, we have lost that in the church. So I'm living a life that is in disharmony with the Word of God. And now I'm going to believe God for a miracle. And you really can't believe for God for really for a miracle when you're in disobedience. That it just doesn't work. But what we do is now we have come up with a doctrine to throw money at it. Hmm. And uh, if throwing money ever worked for anything, it would work for the federal government, which means the federal government, I mean, it throws trillions of dollars at things and has nothing really viable to show for it. If, if just throwing money at something solved things, then the federal government would be producing miracle after miracle after miracle, if you will. But we, we've lost this concept that the life that I'm living today builds my tomorrows. That when, I, when, I'm, when I'm faithful to God and I'm faithful to keep his commandments, regardless of what my flesh wants, I am actually creating the blessing of God for tomorrow. And I, I think God's real best is that I never really need a miracle except in extreme situations because the, the, the just shall live by his faithfulness to the covenant. Taking God's faithfulness for granted, that he is a covenant-keeping God, and in Genesis, the first four covenants are introduced. So very important, whether or not you're a seven covenant or eight covenant person doesn't really matter. The first four are established in Genesis. And they lay the foundation for uh, what the Gentile believer is, his inheritance. Uh, his, yes. his inheritance is, is clearly the Genesis 15 biblically mandated borders of Israel. They become heirs to land, to the, the commonwealth of Israel. I don't think I could ask a church-going Christian what they're grafted into, what the commonwealth of Israel is, what that means, and what they are supposed to do in response to this incredible gift given to those that were not sons and daughters, but are now called family. And they have this incredible inheritance. Well, don't you think, too, that we theologically there's a lot of, of uh, this uh, being disingenuous. Uh, there, there's this intellectual disconnect that we think whenever you have one covenant and you put another one there, it nullifies the previous covenant. No, it doesn't. It builds upon. Uh, but Dr. Walter Kaiser, in one of his books on the Old Testament, uh, made this statement about what we call the Brit Hadashah, the, the, the new covenant. It, it's not in the, that we, we were learning more about the Hebrew. It's not new as something that never existed. It literally means expanded covenant. That God took the covenant he had made with Abraham, and now he's fulfilling it by expanding it to include the Gentiles. Every single one of those covenants build upon the other. They're the very foundation of what we live today. But yet we throw them out saying, no, no, they were all nullified because we have something completely new. Just yesterday morning, I was speaking and... Uh, I have this very interactive group, so I wasn't preaching, I was, um, I don't know what it is when you combine preaching with teaching, There's, we have to come up with some name for that because you and I do it the same way. Every message we present has a deep fundamental 
take away teaching to it, not just the gospel message. And so I took him back to Jeremiah 31, 31. And I said, I want you to read the words as they're stated. And it says, Behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And it will not be like the old covenant written on tablets of stones, but I will write my law in their minds. And I said, stop right there. Where is the word new in that statement? And they said, what do you mean? I said, did he say he was going to write a new laws or was he going to make a new covenant? What laws was he going to place in our minds that would be in our hearts? He's only established one law. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you, I'm going to write my new laws in your mind and they will be in your heart. I'm going to write my laws. These are the same laws that he has established. So Jesus comes along, Matthew 5, 17, explains, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. He said, until heaven and earth pass away, not the least stroke of the pen shall disappear from the law. And then he makes a statement that the church will not address. And that is, and those who teach others to break this law, and they themselves break this law, will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. And those who uphold this law and teaches, teaches others to do so will be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. And so Paul comes along and he says, look, uh, these people are struggling with trying to figure out what laws apply. So they came down with four from the Jerusalem Council, which are extremely provocative, extremely relevant, uh, sexual immorality, uh, the huge issue of the day, LGBTQ+, plus, plus, and question mark. Uh, there's one of them that applies to the Gentiles, uh, abstaining from the blood. Which is advanced kashrut. It's not, it's not basic because they were all god fears. They were already eating biblically. Exactly. Yep. Uh, then strangled meat uh, and meat sacrificed to idols, which brings up uh, things like, do I eat halal meat? Okay. No. Uh, you don't because this was butchered in a facility dedicated with over a speaker, the same way we do it in the kosher facilities, that there is a shocket, uh, kosher butcher, that uh, follows a prescribed method for the severing of the uh, juggler vein without bringing any pain or suffering to the animal, and then the lifeblood is drained, so you abstain from the lifeblood, we're not talking about a rare steak. We're talking about arterial lifeblood. Uh, and it is prayed over and dedicated to the Lord. In a halal facility, uh, it is prayed over and dedicated to Allah. Therefore, it is meat sacrificed to an idol. Well, with halal meat, too, there's also a tax that every anytime you would buy it, you, a portion of, of that price you pay goes for, for the funding of jihad worldwide. People are just so clueless in connecting the dots of what is a Christian. I gave a monologue. I do a prophecy teaching on every Thursday at 12 o'clock where I take the first segment and it's just a monologue. It's just me putting it out there. Uh, in many cases, it's uh, last week was about how can you define yourself as a Christian and support abortion and support LGBTQ+. How can you be a gay Christian? How can you follow the teachings of Messiah and the disciples and actively continue and not pursue a way out? I understand this was the condition you came to faith in. And it's going to be a process for you to endeavor to make every effort you can to line up with the teachings of Messiah. And that may take a while uh, for you to extract yourself or uh, like some of our guests who have been on the program who said, I'm still 
struggling with same-sex attraction, but I've committed a life of celibacy because of my commitment to trying to find a way to navigate so that I don't have to um, put myself at odds with the teaching of Messiah. I still have the struggle. Paul had his own struggles. So it's a real live struggle, but you endeavor to transform and to conform to a model given to us. And this idea of being a gay Christian or being a pro-life Christian um, really in so many ways um, taints what I left not left behind because I'm still living as a Jew. I still I was born a Jew, live as a Jew, I'll die as a Jew. Uh, but in how to present a gospel message to people that look at that as, well, you have this um, wide range, all-encompassing. I can be anything I want and call myself a Christian. There's no standard to be set apart. And so when we come to the priesthood, the royal priesthood, those are set apart, you're left behind. You're, you're, you are the goat. You are the hairy Esau connected goat of the parable of the sheep and the goats. Well, you know, I, I think part of the what, what has caused that is they use the Word of God as nothing but a prop. Uh, I was reading a an article uh, by a local pastor that uh, they're, 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 like you said, they're extremely inclusive. And they said, you know, that we, we can't use the Word of God as, as the rule of thumb for what we live by. And he classified himself as a mystic Christian. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this word come up more and more, whether it's uh, in that particular movement, uh, the charismatic movement, they're gone into mysticism. I was on a show here not too long ago called Up Front and the Prophetic, and one of the things, I can't remember if we did it on air or off air, but we were discussing uh, praise and worship teams. <clears throat> and there's this whole thing going around that you can't go to the next level as a praise and worship leader and as a Christian songwriter without becoming a mystic. And it's contaminating everything. You know, it used to be that um, sound doctrine could be derived by the songs that we sing. And now they're so full of air. I mean, it sounds really great. It may rhyme, but it is not the Word of God. And for many people, the songs they sing are the only indoctrination to the Word of God they ever receive. You know, they, they'll sing these Christian songs all day long on the Christian radio, and they'll spend uh, in a church service maybe 15 minutes in, in some kind of, of sermonette, and they don't realize that that music bypasses uh, your rational part of your mind and begins being in bed of emotively. And they're, they're being fed mystic doctrine in the very songs that we sing. And so if there was ever a time to return to publicity, brother, it's in, it's in our generation. It is. You know, I don't know if you've been, if I mentioned it to you or not, but we are launching as the third branch with three pillars of our ministry. Uh, the first pillar is to teach. And so I teach three days a week in three different churches in three different cities. And I teach old old-time uh, Hebrew, English, and the expository message behind it, and the interconnection, the foundation, uh, in trying to explain to the church, if Jesus made the statement, I only say what I heard my father say, and I only do what I saw my father do, and you have the text of what his father said and what his father did, but you don't recognize it as a record of what his father said and what his father did, then you need to go to this class, which is verse by verse. Uh, I spent 92 weeks in Genesis, 92 hours in teaching Genesis. We have no time limit, and now we're in Exodus, and we'll invest that kind of time in it. 
the second leg of our ministry is to reach. So teach to reach. That's what the television program is about. That's to reach people who we wouldn't normally come into contact with in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Israel, in um, Korea, in South America. We, this is a global kingdom reach. The third is to engage. And so my board has gotten together and we're launching Relentless Church. Uh, we created a model that said two components to our service. Worship, not praise and worship, worship, no screens, no lights, no projectors, no words, worship. Isaiah 6, in the presence of God, I cannot stand on my feet. I must put myself in a, uh, as, as, as he did, uh, as Isaiah did, um, and he examined himself. That's what worship is supposed to do, is church, turn our eyes within. Search me, O Lord, and see if there's anything unclean in me. I use that time for prayer. Use that time for healing. Use that time for coming to the altar. Use that time as your time to worship God. You enter his gates with thanksgiving, so we'll have an outer court. That's going to be the greeting and the, you know, the, the, the talking it up. Then we'll have us enter his uh, gates with... Uh, 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 praise, and there will be a time where there'll be, you know, some music playing, some songs people are familiar with. But once you walk through, um, <clears throat> or we'll have the gates, the courtyard, and then the sanctuary, the um, Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum. And then there, that's for transformation. Jack Hayford said to me, if worship doesn't transform you, you haven't worshiped. Yeah. So we're going to a model that's going to be very unusual for people because it's not follow the bouncing ball. I've I, I, been in a thousand churches. Everybody's eyes are glued to the screen. Nobody's looking within. You've got to keep up with the words. You've got to follow the bouncing ball. There's nothing transformational about it. You feel good, but uh, Dr. Everett, Everett Piper, you, I think you know him. He's the, uh, uh, out of Oklahoma. Uh, he wrote a book that uh, we are not a daycare and that we don't give you a degree in your opinion or in your feelings. We yeah. give, and it was a very hard-hitting book that hit seminaries square between the eyes of uh, this, um, like your opinion matters. No, your opinion doesn't matter. You don't get a degree, a degree in your opinion. You get a degree in the Bible. And so we're going to a model, and when we put the word out that we were creating this model, uh, I received over 200 emails from people that knew me or knew the ministry and said, we have longed for a true Bible church. So, hour of worship, our message. That's the model. Yeah. And you come knowing when you come, you're going to hear music, but it might have words. It probably won't. It's going to be a setting where you can feel the transformational power of God. Uh, I've asked this question before. How many churches have you preached in where the opening is Holy Spirit, come, you are welcome in this place? And my automatic response is, didn't you invite the Holy Spirit here last week? Well, yeah, we do this every week. Then what reason did you give, can you give me, as to why the Holy Spirit left that you have to invite it back? He came in here with me. <laughs> you know, I ushered it in, like the, the baby Jesus. When, Jesus. when Jesus came into the second temple, when we see the dedication of the second temple, it's not like Solomon's dedication, where the Holy Spirit, there was an entrance, there was a, 
a presence. Uh, the Holy Spirit entered the temple. We don't read that same description of the second temple. We know that God sanctioned the second temple because Jesus, who was the embodiment of Father, Son, Holy Spirit on earth, entered that place. And when he departed that place in this world, the curtain was rent in two, and that was the departure of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but our audience, the people you and I talk to, don't examine and look at these scenarios and see what we're doing that is not about, I don't care how you feel. You don't care how somebody walks out after your message and feels. Did you feel the transformational power of God? Did God reveal to you areas to work on? Did you bring it to the altar and have people lay hands on you? Did you get a touch from the Lord? Do you have a word? Going back to that, that and I hate to say it because if you have to call yourself an Acts chapter 2 church, you're probably not one. But this model of they didn't have praise and worship music. They didn't have Hillsong playing in the upper room. They were talking about the Lord and the message of the Lord and then went out and studied together and prayed together. And God added to their numbers daily those being saved. It, I think we, we have lost the, com the, the concept over the years uh, you know, when between Genesis 1 and 1 2, I believe that's when the, the fall of Lucifer happened. And uh, the, the text says that the world became Tahu. And one of the interesting definitions of Tahu is unreality. That the world is literally living in unreality. And when Jesus said, okay, you abide in me, I abide in you, you become my disciples, you shall know, you shall have this experiential uh, encounter with truth. Now that word truth in the Greek, one of its definitions is reality. That the, the whole thing that <clears throat> everything the enemy has put on us, whether whether it's hypersexuality, hyper greed, and you know, in the book of Hebrews it says all of us have the sin that so easily besets us. That sin, that desire is not reality. What the devil's done to us, our past, and all the wounds that, that he has inflicted on us is not the reality that God intended. But as I enter into relationship with this God and I begin really following Messiah and, and, and letting that word of God sanctify me, God begins to peel back the unreality to show me who I really am in him, not what the enemy has tried to make me. And we call it sanctification, and we have lost that. Instead, what we're doing now is we're trying to change the very word that was sent to free us. We now try to pervert it to accommodate our carnality and the unreality that we're walking in. Michael, the seminarians coming out of... Uh, a, a wealth of, of institutions are being trained up in homiletics, hermeneutics, and um, uh, some pastoral care. Uh, you have to take a year of Hebrew just because you have to. And uh, because it's presented the way it is, there's no um, or very few that come out of it with this deep calling, this deep passion to pursue the Hebrew. There's a lot of, a lot of Greek pursuit that comes out of it, but um, how do we get the message to these institutions that say that you've got to examine the curriculum uh, the same way you're doing with your seminary is that if these are not life-changing, and, and what I went through, which was uh, uh, a hybrid where I got to spend 50 hours 
of study with <coughs> Dr. Michael Brown. I got to spend 24 hours of study with Dr. Michael Radelnik. Uh, I got to spend 12 hours of study with Jack Hayford. Uh, this was kind of like you put together your, your curriculum as to what you need to most affect your ministry. Now, of course, I was in my 50s at the time that I had the opportunity to do this and was, was, um, it was endorsed, it was, it was accepted, it was something that said that yes, this will equip you uh, to do in the area of your focus. But we're pumping out people that don't even, uh, it's a vocation, it's not a calling. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded of a story. I've got a friend, Dr. Carl Koch, that he's trained people in Hebrew all over the world. And uh, he was, there was a, a young Indian man in India that he had trained in Hebrew that grew up in, in that environment, okay? Uh, goes and begins attending seminary. And so he's sitting in this class, and this professor's beginning to... Um, dish out this biblical error after biblical error after biblical error. And I mean, he was raising his hand and quoting the guy in the original Hebrew. And the, and basically the, the professor pulled him aside and, and that professor had a, a come to Jesus moment. And the next year that young man was actually teaching in the seminary because they, they had, the, there was this disconnect, you know, whenever you disconnect, the New Testament from the Old Testament, you remove all the definitions. I mean, just the, the hermeneutical principle of first mention, I'm, I'm a big proponent of that, because if you do not follow any doctrine back to its origination, you do not understand that doctrine. You begin the revelation there, and it expands, but it never changes the foundational definition, and they all lead back to Torah. The church has severed itself from that, and so we can make anything that we read in the New Testament mean anything that we want. And because and I think that's been a tool of the devil. I think our seminaries are full of what I, what's, what's called higher textual criticism. Uh, R.A. Torrey and, and many of the leaders in their generation saw the uh, plague of that textual criticism as fine. H higher textual criticism, I think, was actually a... Uh, an operation done by both the mystery religions and maybe even Jesuit influence that leads all the way back to Germany. And uh, it just one, you know, with just a short time, look what it did to Germany. It took them from being very a very Lutheran nation to becoming a Nazi nation. And now our seminaries are full of it. Uh, I was reading a book, I don't know if you've read this by uh, Francis Schaeffer called The Great Evangelical Disaster. Uh, he wrote it back in 82, 84, right, at, right in that time frame. And I mean, back then he was spelling out exactly where the church is today. And he wasn't prophetic as a theologian. He could already see that train leaving the station and knew exactly where it was heading. And that's why it's so important for us to return back to the Word of God. That text is holy. You do not change the word. The word is designed to change you and to bring you back to God's reality of who you're supposed to be. That's why that's why James said, I whenever you whenever you want that word engrafted in you, you have to approach it with humility, with reverence. You bring to my remembrance something um, that I know you get and many of our peers get, but when uh, God said, uh, did you eat from the tree? And Adam's response was, the woman you gave me. Passing the buck. Right? Blame, so he blamed God. Yeah. Right? You blame God. The woman you gave me, she took the fruit and gave it to me, and I ate. So I'm the third person in this. You, you did it. Moses did the exact same thing. Moses stood before God and said, I'm, uh, I'm not well-spoken, I'm slow of speech. And basically, 
God saying to him after he threw the rod down and turned into a snake and picked it up again, after he put his hand in his blouse and it became leprous and he healed it, and after he poured the water on the ground it turned to blood, Moses says, but I'm, I'm not the right guy for the job. And he's actually saying to God, you can perform all these other miracles and you can't perform the miracle of making me a powerful speaker. Again, putting the blame back on God. And God's response is the same response he gave to Job. Listen, who do you think created the mouth? Who do you think created the vocal cords? Who do you think is the God of speech? Who creates the deaf and the mute? I'm the creator of all. To Job, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Where were you when all this went on? And this is so fundamental to our attitude of, of uh, um, fire, aim, pray. I go yeah. out and I buy a new house. I then go to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to dedicate this house to you. Please bless this home. And it would not surprise me if the Lord didn't say, bless your home. I had a home picked out for you six blocks down the road. $50,000 $50, cheaper. Two additional bedrooms. And I know for a fact that it's going to appreciate twice as fast as the home you bought that you want me to bless, but you didn't involve me in the beginning. You now want me to bless what you did in your own strength, and you robbed yourself and cheated yourself of a blessing because my word says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be given unto you. People don't know order. People don't know this incredibly powerful God's message saying, don't do more for me. I don't need your help. Yeah. The position of the Holy Spirit, there's no want ads for it in the paper. Filled. Messiah, filled. Creator of heaven and earth, filled. What I need from you is for you to involve me more, yeah. not do more for me. You know, the sages of Israel in, in, uh, in the creation process said that everything that could ever be created, God created in those six days, okay? Which meant that every answer to prayer was created. God, God is, is, uh, he is omnipresent, which means he fills all time and space. So everything that you were ever going to need that was God's best for you was created in those six days. The concept of allowing God to correct us and walking with the Lord is when I'm faithful and he's number one. That I will walk in because I have to walk in time linearly just like everything, but God doesn't. And so he has placed it his best in front of me that if I'm walking with him and I don't turn to the right hand or to the left, I walk into those provisions, I walk into those blessings, I walk into those discoveries of who I really am that brings me to really understanding the reality of the kingdom. Because there's this dynamic tension in the kingdom, it's now, but not yet. Because, you know, I'm looking for the millennial reign, but yet the kingdom of God is within me. When I'm disobedient and I don't put God first, the enemy gets me off where I walk around the very thing I've been seeking God to bring into my life. And that's why it's so important to return to the Word, to return to being led by the Holy Spirit. Because all the joy everybody's seeking, the joy, the happiness, the fulfillment, uh, really understanding you walking in your destiny, all these things are all wrapped up in this. Come walk with me and I will make you. And somehow or another, we, we have lost that reality. Uh, you can have everything this world has to offer and be empty on the inside. Because all those were diversions from God's reality for you. How many listen to the words of Jesus that says, I am 
most important two words he ever says, I am the way. Haderic. I am uh, um, uh, the truth, ha'emet, and the life, uh, ha'chaim, or um, just ha'im. And those words are the same instruction of Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. You talk about them when you walk along the way, halak. Okay. When you walk along mm -hmm. the way, haderic. So there's nothing new that Jesus is saying because he says, I only say what I heard my father say. So you're supposed to talk about him when you walk along the way, when you rise up and when you lay down. Uh, all of this is a complete picture of God's message to us, the foundational text, and then how to live it as a believer, which is no different than the original set of instructions he gave us as the nation he set apart to be the pattern for the engrafting. So yes. when he says that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light, first of all, he's saying, Aye, asher aye, I, I am that I am, which is why the Pharisees went nuts every time he used those two words, I am, it flipped them out. It's like, if I, want, if I really want to make, mess them up, I just put the words I am in the front of something, and they're going to go crazy. But people don't realize that, because that was the answer given, who shall I say sent me? Aye, asher aye. I am that I am. This was sufficient. It's supposed to be sufficient for us. And when Jesus declares that he is, I am, that we're to go back to search out this truth that are the foundation stones in which it's built on and not reject the Old Testament. It, coming from it as a 44 years in the synagogue, my pursuit was getting answers that weren't fulfilled after finishing Second Chronicles, the end of the Tanakh. When did the seed of the woman crush the head of the seed of the serpent? I'd, I'd ask that question, sitting at lunch with a rabbi I studied with for 20 years. Tell me when that happened, because it hasn't happened in the Old Testament. Therefore, I have to go pursue a knowledge and an understanding of where can I find the answers to certain questions that do not get answered for a reason. Because God's plan always was to give us the remaining covenants, the covenant, and John 3.16 is a covenant, and people don't look at it as a covenant. Okay? I have a part to play in it. It's a two-parter. If I believe if I repent, if I accept, then God will grant me forgiveness and eternal life. That's a covenant. If I don't do my part, he doesn't have to do his part. And it is, covenants are conditional. There's a performance clause. The only covenant that God made that was not conditional was when he made the covenant with Abraham. He, his covenant preceded the confirmation of Abraham's circumcision. God made his covenant with Israel first. Was not conditional. Therefore, it is <coughs> eternal, everlasting, unchallengeable, because it had nothing to do with the performance of man. Yeah. And here you and I are awestruck after all these years with the richness of the beauty and the word of God, and we see that the kingdom army is got blanks in their guns and can't defend their faith and have no real answer for the hope that burns with them because they don't know the text. And sound bites don't work in warfare. No. 
Sound bites do not work in warfare. Although, what's interesting is, is of course, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy three times, gave us the real model, an amazing model of spiritual warfare, and that's if you have command of Scripture. You can frustrate the enemy, and he'll leave you. We have that pattern. Three times he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy. Yeah. And it frustrated Satan, and he left him alone. Yeah. Now, at the same time, with the, Jesus wasn't offering him a soundbite. The truth of the word had been hidden in his heart, where there was depth to what he was quoting. And that's the difference. Abraham. You know, we credit David with a word of I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, O Lord. But in the story of Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac, uh, Abraham was willing to sacrifice his, ton, his son because the word was hidden in his heart. He knew the promise made. And uh, I would like one day for you to have this conversation because we've actually run out of time. We didn't take a break. It's just too much. It's just too good. You, you and I just... Um, um, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I love you. Uh, you are just such a, uh, uh, such a deep part of my heart uh, because we share, and it's not that we always agree. It's because we share the passion for the word that yeah. we do. But I put this out there before. Who had more faith, Abraham or Isaac? And when we examine that question and we look at the scenario of the 12 specific items that occurred in uh, Genesis 22 that are the exact same settings as the crucifixion of Jesus. Two witnesses left behind, carried the wood for their offering up the hill. I could go on and on and on and on. We examine that. Was it the faith of the Son? Not my will be done, but your will be done. We see the whole pattern, the miracle birth, the whole thing, all given to us in Genesis, but we never talk about it when we come to this season of life, death, resurrection, last four days, Exodus 12, crucifixion, all these things, that it was already done on Mount Moriah thousands of years, over 2,000 years before Jesus went through the same process that Abraham and Isaac went through. Yes. And the complete parallels. We've run out of time. This Kingdom Intelligence Briefing should be uh, mandatory coursework. Uh, you know the love and respect I have for you and how much I appreciate our time together. Uh, it's just uh, one of the best hours of the month with uh, a friend, and I thank you for that. I feel the same way, brother. Thank you. God bless you. We'll not see you next month. We'll be in Israel, but uh, we will see you the month after, and just blessings on you, your ministry, all that you do. Uh, may the Lord just pour out upon you a double portion, and uh, yeah, why not even more? Yeah, and I've been praying for God to give you safety when you're over in the Holy Lands. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, my friend. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.